Okay, next up, uh, we have no doubt that psychopaths are among the most toxic people on our planet. If you've been the victim of a psychopath, you know what it's like to, to have to create a safe place in your life where you have your own sacred space. I've studied alongside Daniel Mark Schwartz in the therapeutic sciences, and he specializes in off-grid permaculture, which inspires me. And he knows a toxic person when he sees one. And you'll be able to quickly identify and know how to deal with psychopaths and other toxic people you may run across throughout your life by listening to Daniel Mark Schwartz, <laughs> the smartest guy I know. Oh, well, thank you, Dave. <laughs> All right, so uh, thanks for that great introduction. As you mentioned, I am a um, off-grid permaculturist and also an instructor with St. Paul's Free University. And I tend to approach problems um, from a logical problem-solving standpoint. And so I'm gonna go through three steps that I think everybody should take to work to get past toxic people and start by defining what toxic people are. And so it, it may seem a little strange, you know, why is an off-grid permaculturist talking about toxic people? Well, I actually started uh, my investigations and my, uh, my formal education is in physics. And I went into physics because I wanted to learn to solve the world's problems. Well, what I found out as I went along is, well, you need to know about chemistry and you need to know about engineering and then you, you work your way up and you need to know about people. You can't solve any problems without knowing people. And conversely, a lot of people problems come down to how we organize our society and the technology that we use. So I think at the end of this, um, I'm gonna hit some points that you probably have never heard before about how to deal with a psychopath or a toxic person. Um, but to start with, what is a toxic person? So I think all of us have, um, if I can get this to go, all of us have experienced a toxic person before. Um, this is my definition of a toxic person. And uh, before I get going in depth, I'd like to mention this, this is an open conversation I consider. So if anything comes up um, that you want to mention or questions during the course of my, um, what I'm saying, feel free to, to blurt it out or raise your hand. Or if you want to get it on the stream, we can bring over a mic to you. And if you have a little longer bit to say, um, yeah, so don't be shy at all. I don't mind if you interrupt. I prefer it, in fact. But so what is a toxic person in my definition? A toxic person who is somebody who is a master of emotional and mental manipulation. And they do it so well, you may not even realize for years that this is what they're doing. But you can tell um, a number of different ways, but one of the ways is you feel emotionally drained around them because they are essentially leeches in a way. I and mean, it, it's not to disparage them necessarily, but the way that they act is they're trying to get something out of you and it tends to make you feel bad after being around it. They want you to be completely dependent on them for approval, for friendship, for everything, because they want to control you. And they want to control you at the deepest possible level that they can. Um, on this converse side, they do not want to take responsibility for what they do. Right? Everything they do is your fault. Um, so they want complete control over you without having any control over themselves. So where do you find these people? Well, everywhere. Friends, um, it may take a year, it may take longer for them to really fully expose themselves, especially if you're not trained or if you haven't had the experience to see what, um, you know, what their standpoint is, what they're coming from. Unfortunately, family, if you, that's you know, basically a lottery, but in uh, any large enough family, you're going to have one or two, unfortunately. Um, so you have to deal with them. But particularly dangerous is institutions. And this is because psychopaths want control and they love to go to places where they can get control and this is places where there are vulnerable people so children at schools or universities um, government they love being in government um, religious institutions depending on the institution but I think everybody knows cases where they've seen where there's been you know uh, predators inside of religious institutions um, and the workplace Right. The workplace in our society is probably one of the most authoritative structures that we have. Um, you, you're assigned to do your job. You, know, you have to stay because you need the money. Yet, you're working with these psychopaths who are working their way up the ranks as well. And the psychopaths, the skills that they have in manipulation works really well in how business is structured today. So they, they often do get into positions of management. They often get into positions of power. Um, because they make a lot of money for the company, but unfortunately, uh, that makes it very difficult to get away. 
So, and essentially the takeaway is that where you're gonna find the most vulnerable people is where you're gonna find the most psychopaths. And not everybody in these institutions, of course, is a psychopath. It's probably a very small minority if you ferreted them all out, but unfortunately they have an outsized um, impact. So how do you know? Knowing who is toxic and who isn't is probably one of the most difficult things to get started um, because they're so good at hiding themselves. So here's a few techniques that you can look for. Um, they're constantly playing the victim. Right? I don't know if anybody can think of a situation where this has happened, but um, they can somehow turn everything that you do into a direct attack against them. Um, they're constantly trying to control and they generally work if they if they can't get major control over somebody they'll start with minor things so don't sit that way um, I don't like when you use my stapler uh, you know write it in blue ink I don't like you know purple ink whatever it is they take the littlest minuscule things and they build it up and up and up until it becomes uh, every aspect of your life if they can um, and they back this up with being judgmental so they will put a disparagement on what you're doing in a way to control you. So, oh, that doesn't look good. Or why would you wear that? Um, at the same time, they're extremely jealous of people around them who they think are being more successful, have more love. Um, and so that is, in my experience, one of the easiest ways that you can find them. They'll be jealous over things that no normal person would even think to be jealous of, right? So if somebody just says something about them being, you know, uh, you know, why do they get to sit over there? You know, but it's really just everyone sits where they want. That is a great sign that you're dealing with a toxic person or potentially a psychopath. And complaining. Yes? One of my friends says they're entitled victims. Entitled victims. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. <coughs> mm -hmm. Do you have any examples of that that you can think of? An entitled victim? Yeah. Uh, oh. Like, to help people, you know, it's, it's hard to think of things on the fly, but if you have an well, experience with I'm one. because I'm so victimized, I'm entitled to special treatment. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I mean, yeah. They'll, so they'll play victim, but that being that victim entitles them to special treatment. That's right. So they're parlaying their, their victimhood into a way that they can gain control over you. Yeah, thank you very much. That, that's actually very helpful. Um, so complaining. People are constantly complaining. Um, that's kind of the world that we live in, but... Psychopaths love to complain. Um, they just live off of that because it's part of the emotional circle that they use to justify their behavior and to build up their uh, you know, mechanism of control. So the biggest way, or the biggest danger of psychopaths, as they were sh she was saying, is that they turn um, their problems into your problems. So they never let anything stick onto them if they can help it. They always turn it around and put the mirror to you and say, you're the crazy one, you're the psychopath, you're controlling me. Um, so these are the games that psychopaths are going to play. And you're gonna see it all the time in so many different varieties, but these are three really common, you know, uh, or let's say strategies that they use. Blame game. So they are going to play the game where they try to assign blame and whoever their victim is, is the one being blamed for it. But it doesn't have to be the victim necessarily, too. It can be third parties. They, they will blame everything on some, somebody else, and they're really adroit at the wordplay that it takes to formulate their perspective of the group into being your fault. And that's part of why they're so dangerous, because they can turn a group of people against you. They can turn your immediate family or friends against you by their constant complaining and their behaviors, making it so that uh, people see it their way. And this is something that starts off, you know, every, you'll see this all the time, blame game, but isolation is really the dangerous one. And this is when you're in a real more serious relationship with somebody. It can even, I've even seen this with employers trying to do with their employees, um, you know, <coughs> employers being toxic people. They try to make it so that the, their victims have no other option. They cut away their friends as much as possible. They cut away their family. They want them alone with the, you know, alone and controllable and, um, unable to see any other perspective but that of the psychopaths and you know you see this in cults you see this in any time that somebody wants to manipulate somebody and psychopaths are really good at doing that another thing is the psychological condition of, of getting people to walk on eggshells 
So they're constantly having little emotional explosions and blowing up and blowing things out of proportion because it keeps you, the victim, um, unbalanced, right? If you never know what's gonna happen, and at this point you still care about this person, you wanna be, you know, have a good relationship with them, you have to be in a fight or flight type mode around them to where you can't al analyze what's actually going on. So it's a way, another way of taking away your power. And so toxic people are master manipulators, they're skilled liars, and they are great actors. So you may have been around a toxic person for half your life and not even realize that that's who they are. So how do we get through this? I'm going to go through what I consider to be the three most important steps, but it all comes down to building a foundation, right? They're trying to push you over. They're trying to blow you around. They're trying to, you know, mix you up. And the only way that you can get past that is by putting your foot down on solid ground and realizing what is BS, you know, what's their imaginary story and what is reality. And the first step, um, I think, so if you're taking somebody through a process, I would always start with forgiveness. Um, now, this doesn't necessarily mean start with this if you're in a position where you're so vulnerable that um, you're not sure that you can do it yourself. In that case, I would seek somebody that knows what they're doing and that you trust to help you get through this. But um, that aside, the first thing is forgiveness, but do not forget. Um, I've always loved this quote. I tried to find the source, but I don't know who originally said it. But holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Right? Anger doesn't actually help. Um, it has a point to get you past certain situations, but by nursing anger and holding on to anger, which is often the first reaction when you realize that you've been victimized for so long by these people, um, it doesn't help get away from them. And w why is that? Well, it, okay, it is natural to be angry, but it doesn't help us get past them because that is the natural mode of thinking of a psychopath, right? These resentment, anger, um, feelings of betrayal, all that type of behavior, or all those types of emotional states are really easily parlayed by a toxic person into returning you into their zone of control. They plan emotions. They try to get you emotional to get you back in line. And those types of emotions, they really understand because a lot of these people are feeling that all the time, right? They're not necessarily victimizing you because, um, you know, they're not necessarily consciously doing it. A lot of times these people are just living in that world. Their mind is constantly like that. And so they have to, to act like that. Um, and the other problem with holding on to anger and resentment is that it leaves you in a state where you can't see the truth of the matter. The more emotionally tinged we are, especially with negative emotions, the more easy it is to, to make up your own story. And that if the story isn't reality, it's probably going to put you in a worse place, right? Being able to actually see clearly what was going on, what your mistakes were, you know, what the methods they were using and what vulnerabilities you have is a huge step in being able to take, you know, little by little, get out of that situation, get out of the relationship with us, the next step. Um, and the other thing is compassion is power, right? If you walk into a, you know, a situation, let's say you work with a psychopath or you work with a toxic person and you have to deal with them, right? Your livelihood depends on it. You're not in a position where you could go somewhere else at this time. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, by being compassionate for them, understanding that everybody has a life story um, and, uh, they are living their own truth. And they're not necessarily bad people. They just do bad things. So you can love the person, but you can hate everything they do. And I'm not saying forgive them and let them keep doing what they're doing. You know, you need to deal with it. But by having, coming into interpersonal reactions, or re reactions, um, relations with that compassion for them and that perspective is so powerful um, I've seen it to where if you can just get that centeredness and look at them straight in the eye and say, you know, I, I care for you, but I don't care for what you're doing. Sometimes that is enough to just, you know, bl blow the whole thing wide open. And now they will come back almost always and try to, you know, undo that. But it's such a powerful uh, state of being that it's, it can't be overstated. And that's something that you can do yourself without making any external moves. So you don't have to, like, broadcast your position or, um, you know, get more heat put on you by the psychopath in your life because you can do this on your own, um, you know, in your own mind. 
So big takeaway, you can love the person, but you can hate their actions. So compassion isn't about saying what they're doing is fine. You're, they're saying, you know, I think all individuals are worthy of being loved, but sometimes you need to say, hey, back off, right? So the next thing is you need to get out of this situation as quickly as possible. Um, there is probably a way to, um, to get psychopaths to be better people, but I only believe you can do that if they're on board with it. You know, everyone has free determination and they're gonna do what they wanna do. And um, if it's come to the point where you've been victimized by them or you're, they're trying to victimize you, you need to set up a boundary and you need to you know, limit your contact with that person. So the most important thing about getting a toxic person out of your life is setting boundaries, right? You need to know when, because they're gonna push these, so you gotta keep your eye out, set, this is, you know, if it's a family member, this is how I interact with them. This is the type of situations I'll be with them in. And these are, uh, as, you know, this is as far as I'll go. And as soon as they cross the line, you need to make that clear and you either get out or, you know, do whatever uh, steps you have in place to make sure that everything goes back to the right way. And a big thing is getting help. Um, it's so difficult to get out of these situations because we get convinced, you know, we get back in the story. And if it's something you've done for a long time, which often it is, uh, it's difficult to see what's actually going on without an external perspective. So getting help is the biggest thing you could do. Um, you need somebody on your side so that you can get feedback to prevent backsliding into the old situations. And the other thing is that you can use these people to help you and teach techniques. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details of these, but these are ones that I like to use. Um, there's tons of journaling methods, directed question and answer situations, just plain old journaling that is amazing for being able to go back, you know, a week or a couple weeks later and read about what the situations were. And oftentimes when you've calmed down, you can read and go, oh, well, if this were somebody else, I wouldn't let that happen, you know? It's way easier in the third person to read your life as a story to make good sound decisions than it is to do it when you're in the moment. Um, Got to introspection, psychosomatic techniques, which we did a little bit with uh, Wendy before, which was uh, very uh, helpful. And then um, I'm a big fan of active meditations, uh, you know, different techniques where you're melding mind and body together. And this is all about getting yourself centered and getting yourself in a mental position to where you can take the actions that, it, that it, you know, uh, take the actions that get you away from this situation. Because usually the difficulty that people have is just doing it, right? You kind of know what needs, to get, what needs to be done. There are little tips and tricks you can have to get you, you know, through difficult situations. Um, but really, it's just getting yourself in the right mental state to where you can do what you need, uh, what you know needs to be there. Another big thing is getting out of that isolation and building community, um, building up support networks. And in particular, I love the idea of, mo of modeling, which is if your life is in a position where you need to be, um, figure out what you want and find people that are doing it. And there's so much learning that can be done outside of books, just going and being around people that are doing what you want to do. So the, the classic example that everyone probably cites is if you want to make more money, don't hang out with people who want to make more money. Hang out with people that have more money because what they're doing and the way they think and the behaviors that they have will start rubbing off on you. And the same thing is with toxic people. So if you are looking to build a better relationship or uh, get a, a better workplace, go find one, you know, ask around, just walk into places and see if that is what you're looking for. And if it is, figure out a way to be there more. You know, if you want to be stronger, go spend time in the gym. You don't even have to work out. Just by being there more and more, you're gonna get, build up that, that mental perspective and build up the interest and the knowledge to get to where you want to go. And so this is what I've been building up to. And I think this is a, a point that you don't hear much because we all start with ourselves and we start with putting ourselves in a better situation. But really what we need is a world that allows less psychopathy to happen. And so where is this coming from? Well, a lot of psychopaths in our modern society are aided and embedded by our system of business, right? Consumerism and corporate culture are great for toxic people. Toxic people thrive in large corporations. They thrive in huge bureaucracies. Um, and partially because they operate on the wavelength of greed and egoism. And that's what these corporations are building up. For. That's how they, they operate as well. Um, and if you look at, there's a really interesting talk about, by a man who studied drug dealers in New York. Um, I believe this was back in the 90s when drug, you know, drugs in that area were particularly prevalent. 
and he actually did a person-by-person person hierarchy, like a business org chart of drug dealing gangs in New York. And what he found is that gang organization and how they operate is identical to McDonald's, right? And it's, it's not a coincidence. Like the, <laughs> the best customers you could ever have are addicted to your product. And it's not a matter of consciously moving that way. It's the matter of we have thousands of people doing thousands of things and the ones that get you addicted make it more and more and more money. And so we're moving in a realm where every single thing wants to make you addicted to it, right? Look at how many subscriptions have you had versus 10 years ago, you know? Everything is becoming a subscription service. You have to subscribe to your software, to your computer, to, they want people to subscribe to juicing machines. Like it's getting ridiculous, but that is what they like. And the way that they get people to do stuff like that is by locking them in, getting them addicted, making it so that they can't leave. And they're basically, um, they're basically like non-corporal psychopaths. Like these corporations are building up a structure where there may be, it may be every single individual is a great person and is trying to do what they think is best. But as a collective, they are um, imprisoning people and trying to make a toxic society. And the other thing is what we do with our time, you know, by buying into this and by spending all our lives uh, building up that structure, it's actually hurting us as individuals in the way that we feel. And I love this quote, the verdict you pronounce upon the source of your livelihood is the verdict you pronounce upon your life. So it's very difficult to say, I'm a, you know, I'm a great person, I'm doing what I need to do, except you know, when I go to work, I you know, sell really bad used cars or something. Now that's a really easy example, but the, the problem is we may be just going to work and pushing papers through an office or you know, doing things that actually seem to help people, but if it's part of a larger corporate structure that isn't helping people, um, we are still responsible for, for that. So what I am interested in doing and why I do off-grid permaculture is giving people the tools to slowly work themselves out of that system as much as they want to. And that comes from having independence. So it, it may be energy dependence, independence, food independence, um, independence from corporate m mode of entertainment, um, independence from needing uh, approval from society in certain ways, you know, through Facebook or whatever it may be. And independence is extremely important with talk to people because it gives you the power to say no. I, I have a feeling that half of our problems with talk to people would be solved if you didn't have to show up to a workplace that was full of toxic people, or you didn't have to sit in the DMV and deal with toxic people there. If the more that we can get away from this, the better off we're going to be. And I like to start with the basics, right? We could start, you know, nationwide plans for whatever, but really all we really need is food, water, shelter, and warmth. And if we can get that down and get that mostly independent, then we have a big s stick to say no, right? Okay, you, you probably, if you have this, you'll probably still want to be working because you want to do other more interesting <laughs> things than just, you know, subsistence farming, say. But when you know that that's behind you and you have a pantry full of food and you have enough, you know, solar panels or generators to, to live off of, reasonably comfortably with nothing else besides what you have on hand that gives you the, the power to say, well, I'm not going to do this. You know, why would I work at this job? I'm going to take the time and, you know, give myself the space to find something that I really love doing and that isn't full of crazy people. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so how do you do this though? Yeah. Well, the first, the biggest and easiest thing to do is the downsize, right? If you've spent time traveling like I have through other countries, you know, Thailand, India, what we assume to be normal, and everyone knows this, but what, you know, what, what comes out is what we assume to be normal is gigantic. And if you just took the time, you know, I challenge everybody to take a vacation or, you know, 30 days off if you can and find a place that you can live tiny and just downsize and see how much you can go without. Or another really interesting uh, way of doing this is actually just taking everything you haven't used in the last two months, say, that isn't like a very seasonal item, and just put it in a box and put it in a storage unit, and then let it sit for another two or three months, and then go through and realize how much stuff you didn't even care wasn't there. And if we can get rid of this stuff, one, we'll reduce our expenses, but two, we can significantly decrease our rent and utility expenses. You know, smaller structures are way more efficient, just naturally, um, and also, they c we can even use other methods, which I'm working on on my website, to beef that up to where it's possible that you could spend almost nothing on the way that you live. 
um, as opposed to spending, what was it, average is around half of your income on rent and utilities. So that gives you a lot, you know, what if your, your income was essentially doubled? Wouldn't that give you the choices to, to get away from toxic people? Um, food, right? It grows on trees. So <laughs> there's no reason why we have to be beholden to a large-scale, environmentally destructive industrial farming system when you, it just grows out of the ground. You know, all we need to do is take the time and, and have the knowledge to learn how to do it. And we're in a really interesting place as a society now because of you know, internet technology. There's more and more techniques coming out and we have the power to regionally spread ideas that were never spreadable before. You know, as a distributed consciousness of people working together and each person finding a little tidbit here and a little tidbit there, we can easily double or triple um, the amount of food that is possible to grow in a small plot of land. Uh, I've followed a, a couple of different examples. There are people living entirely off of quarter acre lots with six member families. Right? It's doable even in a city and it's especially around here. We have a great environment for growing. Um, you know, it could be better for certain things, but we definitely have what it takes to grow all of our food. And I've seen uh, national level research done by the government that they, uh, according, to the what, um, according to the numbers that they ran, it's possible in the, in the United States to grow 90% of all of our food within 50 miles of where we live. So off-grid energy, um, it's there. We, we can get it now. In the last 10 years, it is reasonably priced, doable, but you have to be proactive. You know, Elon Musk is not going to come to your house and give you energy independence. He will go to your house and install some solar panels for free, right? And then you pay him every month. And then if you want to get it out, you have to pay him several thousand dollars, right? That's locking you in. None, there's no corporation, there's no government that's going to come and give you independence because they don't want you to be independent. They want to have control over you because that ensures that they, their organization and their personal livelihood will survive. Um, off-grid energy, of course, is environmentally friendly because if you're producing all your energy from the place that you live, then you, you're not polluting because otherwise you'd realize it and stop. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then it gives you that security to know that I have everything that I need and there's nobody that can come and take it away from me. And therefore, you're in a super powerful, powerful position to say to the people around you that don't need to be around you, you know, step back. And pr probably the, the most exciting thing about this is the ability for people to follow their passion and grow into what they want to be. And I see there's so much, you know, so many people doing jobs that are kind of meaningless and they don't really like, but it pays the bills. What if you followed your passion, right? What if what you did every day, you know, there's going to be work, there's going to be hard times. But what if you did every day was something that you felt super drawn to and you wanted to make a contribution? Like the... The difference between somebody that's super engaged in what they're doing and the, the like creativity and excitement that they have and the things that come out of it between the, the, you know, the average office person that I've worked next to that just shows up uh, barely in time, sits down, does barely enough, takes an early lunch. You know. There's so much human potential that's there. And so the society that we are growing into has the potential to be 100 times better than we even thought was possible because there's so many creative minds that aren't being engaged at all. So, and it's great, of course, f from the standpoint of developing your own community because you're essentially your own boss. I think we're moving towards uh, a social structure to where we're increasingly um, becoming essentially contractors or freely associating individuals to where if you have a, you know, you work with somebody that isn't doing it for you or isn't on the same wavelength as you or is actively trying to manipulate you, well, then, you know, you don't renew that contract. That deal is over. You're now your new boss. You only work with people that you want. And by using um, off-grid techniques that, that I discuss in my courses as far as how to set up your own income and to b build up your own infrastructure, you know, you get to be close to family. There's a great uh, video that I shared on my uh, YouTube with a comedian, but he was, <laughs> he wakes up early in the morning and he, he's looking around and he says, it's 5 a.m. and I'm already at work, right? <laughs> you, you cut the commute out and uh, cut out all that extra stuff, but be there with your family. There, you know, we're, there's a whole other discussion and topic about this, but we're, we're in a society where, um, you know, 
parents are absent. Children don't have their parents around. We, we're, we're not spending hardly any time with our families, and when we do, family time is, you know, watching Netflix or going to a movie. And um, what I would rather see, and what I think is possible for us to do, is family time where we're actively producing the food that we eat and learning about the world and developing a new family structure that is far beyond anything that we've had in the past. And, you know, good families are the best way, especially with when you have, you know, two parents that are there active in the children's lives, is proven to be the best way to produce well-adjusted children and maybe stem the tide of psychopaths in the future, or at least toxic people. So how do you do this? Well, take steps to learn, you know. Learn a little bit here, learn a little bit there. I'm not asking, you know, you to, to cut the lease on your house and move out today, you know, or the end of the month. Uh, all you need to do is, little by little, plant a garden, maybe even just a few pots if you don't have a, a yard. You know, put up a few solar panels, get your hands on it. Um, so anyway, that's what I'm all about. Um, this has been Overcoming Toxic People. If you're at all interested in any of the stuff I do, um, you can find me at St. Paul's for University, and all my off-grid stuff is on offgridpermaculture.com. Well, the, the concept of that, yeah, thanks for asking. The, the concept of off-grid permaculture is the idea that we live, so we're constantly seeing a more centrally organized society to where, you know, all the food is produced by 80% of, you know, sorry, 80% of the food is produced by 20% of the companies and so on and so forth. So what I'm trying to do is get people off-grid in the sense that they're producing more and more of their necessities locally, either in their own home or own community. And then permaculture is a, technique of studying nature and of trying to devise a whole system you know from the bottom up from technology to people that is capable of infinitely sustaining our society as opposed to so it's essentially a circular system to where everything has a use you know every waste has a use as opposed to our trash society where we take raw resources use them for a little while and then put them in the hole in the ground and then do it again so Anyway, short, short elevator pitch, Good. but <laughs> yeah. And then uh, if, if there isn't any other questions, I looks like uh, our next w is at 11.15. And that will be, of course, by our illustrious leader, uh, David Masters, <laughs> and the, the, the head of our psychopath coaching program. And so if you're, you know, if you stayed this long, be sure to take the time to listen to Dave's because he's really the keynote speaker of this whole event. And uh, uh, thanks for coming. If you have any questions for me, feel free to approach me at any time. Thank you, Dave. Mm -hmm.